Bikepacking can be challenging enough, especially when you're traveling through rugged terrain. Now imagine doing all that and carrying 10 pounds of camera gear and trying to make an interesting narrative film about the experience. In this episode of PLP Talks, I interviewed Jay Ritchie, who's been in the bike industry for a long time, uh, who did just that for a film called El Silencio, which is actually going to go on tour in May. We talk about the challenges of filming while bikepacking, especially in rugged terrain, and how filming a bikepacking trip can sometimes change group dynamics. We also talk a little bit about his latest endeavor, Red Star Bags, which is is a, a take on the Caridy saddlebag, but kind of modified to carry camera gear and film equipment. But before we get started, if you guys have enjoyed this series, if you've listened to past episodes and have learned something new, or have had fun listening in on the conversations that I've had on this show, consider supporting the channel. For as little as $3 a month, you can keep this show going, or if you're more of the one-time payment kind of person, you can do that. There's a link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube, and there's also gonna be links in the show notes if you're listening to this via podcast. This episode is also supported by the Ramble Ride. Check them out at ramblerides.com. Imagine all the things you love about bikepacking, the challenge of carrying your gear, the amazing remote and scenic routes, and the camaraderie amongst friends at the end of the day. Without the things you dislike about bikepacking, the planning, the logistics, the carrying your food and having to cook, and you have the Ramble Ride. The Ramble Ride is a unique semi-supported bikepacking experience. We got a chance to ride the Oregon one last year and it was truly a stunning event. It took us on roads and places that we never knew existed. So if you're looking for a different kind of cycling event that is part challenge and all fun, then definitely check out the Ramble Ride at ramblerides.com. This is another great episode, especially if you're a film and bike nerd. So put on those earbuds, pretend like you're working at your desk and enjoy the show. And I'm super stoked about our guest. We actually met him uh, several years ago when he was still working at Rivendell. And I'm a fan of his films and just his photography and just visual sense. So welcome to the show, Jay Ritchie. Thanks for having Thank, thank for, you. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. First met you, you were working at uh, Rivendell. How did that come about? And it sounds like Daniel um, from Tumbleweed, there's also, there's all roads lead back to Rivendell at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of connections through there. Um, yeah, so Daniel was there before me and he, um, he left Rivendell because he was going on a long trip. I think he was doing the Continental Divide. So um, I was up in Portland working at the bike gallery in Hollywood. And, um, and then um, I uh, had known Grant Peterson for a couple of years by that point. And, um, and um, I just kind of bugged him and wanted to know um, if he had any openings because all my family is down there mm -hmm. um, and old friends and stuff. So yeah, when there was an opening, thanks to Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, how, yeah. how long yeah. did you work there for? Uh, it was like three, three and a half years. Maybe. Okay. So, so not too long, but yeah, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. It's a really great company. They, it's like a family. So yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I feel like they've been like so uh, influential to many people, and just recently, like all the people they've influenced have, or you know, starting to kind of shape the the bikes that are coming out now. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh yeah. I mean, they've been taking you know road road plus bikes yeah. off road for a long time. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I feel like in, in a way that that must be kind of like both rewarding and frustrating at the same time. Like almost like a Cassandra complex where you're, you've been preaching it, and like only now are people getting it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's amusing. <laughs> so you've you made a couple of films with uh, Tumbleweed. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the brand, can you fill us in about what it is and who Daniel is? Uh, Daniel Daniel is really into gear. He's really like, he's one of those people that just obsesses about that stuff, and he applies it and he applies it to, um, you know, design. He really thinks about it from all angles one of his like main pieces of vocabulary is, is it capable? <laughs> you know, so um, he thinks about that with the design of his bike and his bike is extremely capable and, um, you know, it's meant for 
a roll off hub, uh, hub, um, you know, and kind of off the shelf mountain bike parts. Um, if you guys are familiar, this is like a, these are know this already, but, um, yeah, it's a, a great riding bike and, um, yeah, he just, he loves getting out and feeling secure about his rig and, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. being capable. So, <laughs> it's a, so yeah. What's a, what's a wheel and tire size on, on his bikes? Uh, right. So you, I think his max is like a four inch 26, uh, tire. Um, he just squeezed on some of those new 27 plus, uh, tires on, I think, I think they're scraper 50, mm -hmm. uh, rims and those fit fine. Um, so I'm actually, uh, wanting to try that out too on my tumbleweed. Um, and then you can go, um, you know, 27 plus and then 29 plus and, um, the eccentric, eccentric bottom bracket helps with keeping the bottom bracket at the height you need. Right. So, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so how did you uh, start working with him? Well, um, he was still in the Bay. Well, he came back to the Bay after he did, did the tour divide and I was at Rivendell and, you know, he's really good friends with Grant. And the people at Rivendell, so he just, you know, was hanging out, and we went on some campouts, and um, we kind of went our own our own ways. Um, I went down to Tucson, and then he um, asked me a couple years ago if he'd be interested, if I'd be interested in going with him to Mongolia um, uh, for a trip that he and Cass Gilbert um, at Wild at Riding on Instagram uh, were. Um, uh, scheming up. So of course uh, I wanted to go. So I <laughs> uh, started saving money and, uh, I think I cashed out my HSA account, <laughs> my health savings account. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. Um, and he wanted me to document it in some way. And so, um, I wanted to, I wanted to film it, um, and uh, so I just brought over uh, whatever camera I had, which at that time was a Panasonic GH3, and I think like one zoom lens and a mic, and that was about it. Um, and uh, yeah, we went on that trip, and we've we've been friends, you know, since Rivendell, but became better friends after that. And I've just talked more about, about trips and doing more projects together. So cool. Yeah. <clears throat> So when did you uh, start picking up the camera? Yeah, right. So I started shooting film in high school. So like 1997, eight. Um, and we had a dark room class. I was like, you know, right before all those shut down in public schools. Um, and I just got really into it from there. And still photography and like composition and that type of stuff and lighting uh, has always been a huge, um, exciting topic for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when I was at Rivendell, um, they needed some video content for, you know, how to install racks or fenders and stuff just for their web content. So I started messing around with that and then, um, and then just messing around with like writing videos and, you know, I didn't really know what the frame rate was or, you know, like proper frame rate or like, you know, shutter speed and all that stuff so I was mostly hacking it with whatever equipment Rivendell had and then when I moved to Tucson in like 2012 uh, I invested in my, my own gear and just started uh, just educating myself about how to actually properly film stuff which is an ongoing education as you know yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah it's it's a great it's it's a great thing to explore. So. Yeah. Yeah, I totally remember those early uh, Riv videos. And those are actually part of what inspired me to start making my own. It's like, whoa, they're so simple. Oh. You know, there's music and there's tutorials and they're, they're kind of quirky. And it's like, I can totally do that. So, like, I totally appreciate uh, those early vids. Um, oh, right on. <laughs> so you were, it sounds like you're completely self-taught as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And go to any formal education just internet what was, holes. <laughs> what was the biggest uh challenge for you going from like stills to video uh it's just so much more work like 
it's so much more work. Uh, you just have the audio component on it. You have uh, narrower um, kind of exposure parameters, uh, you know, video, unless you're investing a lot of money in a camera, um, your latitude in the image is much narrower um, in post -pro like post-processing and stuff like that. So you just have to uh, be smarter about how to film and you have to anticipate a lot more. Um, and, uh, and then you had, you had audio on top of that. Yeah. And, you know, those levels. Yeah. So it's just a lot, it's a lot more work. Um, but it's it, do, totally it does make photography feel really easy afterwards, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm going on like a bike packing trip, like I was just out in Arizona, um, hanging out with some friends in February, like I don't want to film. <laughs> I mean, I just like, I just want to take photos. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you just, yeah, it's not as a, a big of a burden, but you know, I like filming if someone really wants, uh, something wants a product. Um, I really like doing that and, uh, yeah. 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 I think one of the, the toughest things for, to get my head around was like in photography, you're generally, um, like working towards like a moment, but like in filmmaking, mm -hmm. like it's, you can't just shoot you know, one second photo and have that stand, like you have to think like sequence and narrative mm -hmm. and like, you know, establishing shot and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You have to think in like, uh, like kind of like triplets, like how like one buttresses the next thing and kind of stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. So one of the things I, I really liked about, um, the, the video uh, that you, you made in Mongolia was it didn't feel like a typical brand video. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think I forget if, it, if you gave it the label or, um, someone else did, but they called it kind of like obser observational, um, documentary. Can you tell us about like what kind of been, why that style for that one? Yeah. So, um, like, you know, you've seen a lot of bike films and there's a lot of like, you know, shreddy bro, like chest bumping kind of stuff out there, um, which is all fine and good, but you know, you want to, you know, you want to differentiate yourself. And, um, I also like, I have a degree in anthropology. Uh, it's really helping me out now, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, but yeah, like, I really like kind of thinking about things from that point of view. Um, you know, you I, like just kind of creating like a window into an experience, um, of like, you know, moving through, uh, like a different culture, a different landscape, and um, the interaction that comes with being there. I mean, a lot of people that travel internationally on a bike, I think some of the, like the biggest highlights of that is like, you know, you're on a bike and you're, you're kind of exposed to people all around you. And some of the deepest like experiences are just those interactions. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily how hard you like shred the gnar on some downhill <laughs> which is always fun yeah but you know that's that's not the whole picture so right. i think that that interaction is also extremely valuable and important so yeah yeah that's actually i think that, that's one of the toughest things to capture but it's also i think personally i mean for me it's one of the things like i remember the most it's like in it sounds sad in some way but like in the beautiful scenery kind of blends together but like there's like really like distinct interesting human interactions is like what's what stuck out in my mind over the years mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think a lot of people can relate to that yeah <laughs> so how do you like, like how does one film that do you just always have the camera ready to go in case something interesting happens <laughs> try to try to there's tons, there's tons of missed opportunities but you try to you try your best or, like you can to anticipate it um yeah, I mean, on tour, you know, you're wearing a lot of hats um, when you're, you know, when you're filming because you have to like, you know, you're in a group and you're trying to make decisions together all the mm -hmm. time. Like, you know, where are we going to eat? Where are we going to stop? You know, um, you know, should we, you know, should we get supplies for this next stretch? Like there's just like, a, you know, a lot of decisions already that you're immediately involved with. Um, and 
if you take your camera out and you start capturing it, you're removing yourself from that. Like mm -hmm. you're more observing that decision making, but you also have to be involved with that. So it's tough. It's like it's a. I find it pretty challenging. I mean, um, I'm. I'd be curious to like you know how other people do it. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, before like Peru this past summer, I like uh, emailed everybody in the group and said, you know, I I want to be there for you, but unfortunately, probably the shittiest moments are gonna be the moments where I'm not gonna be able to support you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be able to stand back. I'm going to have to stand back and actually capture this. So it's like, it's kind of a shitty place to be in or hard. Sorry, I'm just yeah. but, um, <laughs> but, you know, it's like, it's just like a, it's a tough balance. So. Yeah, for sure. So how did they respond to that? Were they like, okay with it or? <laughs> yeah, they totally understand. And Daniel's like, yeah, let's get the footage. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, well, let's yeah, talk. I mean, yeah. yeah. What's up? Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, your latest trip in, in video. So just kind of set it up for us for people that, that haven't seen the trailer yet or are familiar with it. Sure, yeah. So um, um, again, this is uh, like uh, Daniel and Cass um, wanted to do a trip in Peru. Um, and um, Cass was pretty familiar with Peru. He's done the Peru Divide, um, which is a long, I think a thousand mile trip through kind of like the central to north mountain range in Peru called the Cordillera Blanca. And um, and so uh, we decided it would be about a month or five weeks of riding um, with, a, with some breaks and some padding at the end um, in case we took longer. And um, yeah, so we went down and we flew into Lima, went to Ayacucho, um, which is on a little off route um, from the Prue Divide, but we kind of linked up to the Prue Divide from there and then um, went through just like the most insane mountain ranges I've ever been in. And you're like really out, really out there. Like you're not seeing anybody for probably a couple days at a time when you're deep in there. And like the communities back there are really sparse and small. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then you kind of, we ended in uh, Juarez, which is like a pretty popular kind of trekking town. Um, like there's a lot of really large mountains around there. Um, and then, yeah, we flew out of, and then went back down to Lima. Yeah. So. What was uh, the biggest challenge in terms of the bike packing aspect? Yeah, um, well, balancing like all the gear the filming gear because i mean i think i probably had like 10 extra pounds on my bike of gear like with gear and so you know like and then like everything's really rough so you're thinking about vibration and how not to damage gear and which happened like my gimbal started freaking out my microphone stopped working <laughs> you know like everything just slowly is that why it's called el silencio <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, was, yeah. Um, so it, yeah. So uh, like, so I've been learning how to sew for the last like year, year and a half, and out of like kind of like a need for bags that are good for the uh, camera equipment, you know, high capacity with padding, water protection, all that stuff. So um, I made. A front bag kind of like a front kind of like a caradice and that like it you have like a like a big volume accessible mm -hmm. all at once um if you just undo it quickly and so um like that was kind of like my most of my gear and batteries were in there and then i had a porcelain rocket uh dslr slinger um with uh, like the camera right there on my handlebar so um just trying to be ready um and then you know the it can get really cold up there um weather can change really fast uh, so just like tons of puffies and shells and strong tents and all that so just our bikes were pretty heavy um and like we were probably averaging between 10,000 feet and 15 16,000 feet and it was at sea level <laughs> so 
<laughs> Definitely some altitude adjustment and uh, yeah, uh, just heavy bikes with the camera gear. So yeah, um, it was tough. <laughs> what's the longest span that you guys had to carry like food and water for before resupply? Yeah, some, I think it was like four to five days. And that was like, and like the resupply was like a really tiny store. You know? <laughs> like, it's kind of getting like ramen and like maybe a can of tuna and you know, it's, there's not much, but yeah. um, you know, it's a, like, you're not picky at that point. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's energy. <laughs> so when, like when yeah. I watched the trailer, one of my first, questions from a filmmaking standpoint was like how many batteries did you carry <laughs> and how did you keep everything charged <laughs> uh yeah right so i think i had like four or five drone batteries and this is a dji mavic pro so they're not huge but you know they're probably a pound a pound and a half each or mm -hmm. no i don't really know how much but maybe a pound i don't know yeah um and um so like when we uh, I, so I was thinking like, okay, like a battery a day kind of thing, or maybe a battery every two days. So that's like, you know, 30 minutes of flying. So broke that up into like two 15 minute kind of flies. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like when you kind of come into a small town, we kind of always would try to break at a restaurant if they were open and cross, you know, cross our fingers that they had electricity and like immediately all of us would just like take over like one or two outlets and just like plug like <laughs> <laughs> in. Um, so and then we kind of just like putts around in the restaurant until everything was like charged um so i don't know we just charge up as much as we could there's definitely times where like we were totally out of juice yeah, um, yeah. how many so. how many uh were you shooting with the gh5 yeah how many uh batteries mm -hmm. did you bring for the the camera yeah, so probably uh, like four or five, and that was plenty. It's really efficient on batteries. Um, so, yeah, I probably would next time take one less battery for the drone and one less battery for the GH5. Yeah, so yeah, I'm a huge fan um, of the Panasonic system as well, and like they they do get like amazing like battery life. Like for people that shoot Sony and always like kind of kvetch about like the battery life in the Sony, they should try a Panasonic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're pretty, it's a solid camera. Yeah. So they're and, yeah, pretty solid. When, what, uh, what was the gimbal that you brought along? Mm, it's a pilot fly H2. So it was like a one handed kind of thing. And, uh, I think the battery life on that was like 10 hours of runtime. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty so, good. Didn't have to charge that too often, um, and that was kind of heavy. So, um, fortunately, Daniel carried that for me. <laughs> so, yeah. So when you, you know, when you're packing this, when you're packing this stuff, it fills up really quick. <laughs> yeah. So. So did you? Um, you did some. It looked like you did some writing shots with the gimbal. So. Yeah. Was that just like one handed and? And steering like this, or yeah. did you have a, a rig to to mount the gim gimbal on the bike? No, handing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and on the back brake, um, and then using my left hand to film. Um, yeah, there was one point where my back brake was getting so hot it went out, okay. and fortunately, fortunately, there was a little dip and I could stop. <laughs> but I mean, I would have been effed um, <laughs> if that wasn't so. Um, but yeah, um, kind of, kind of dangerous, kind of hot dog in it, but <laughs> stuff I don't tell my wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for you personally, how did you mentally balance like, okay, I'm just going to ride versus I'm going to film now. Like what was, you know, what were the factors involved in like taking out the camera or not? Yeah. Right. Um, obviously scenery. It's a combination of scenery. Um, if it's like a pivotal moment, like if it's bad weather or if someone's in bad mood or, or I don't, not necessarily a bad mood, you know, to be honest, like everybody was actually in pretty good, pretty good spirits the whole time. Um, um, at the kind of toward the end, like in the last week, I 
I fell pretty hard and I think I fractured my rib or bruised my rib really bad. Mm -hmm. But kind of for me, that was like, I didn't have much additional energy to film that much. Mm -hmm. So um, that was pretty tough for me to try to capture as much as I wanted. Um, But um, yeah, it's a combination of just like the right lighting. Um, You know, if it's a a fun downhill or... um, and like Cass and Daniel would bring it up too because you know they're involved in the process as well. Like Cass is writing um, some of the script for the voiceover, and Daniel is kind of a voiceover uh, person in the film, and obviously producing it. So mm-hmm. um, you know it's it's kind of it's definitely like a like we're discussing it as we're writing and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, lots, you know, I try to sneak in there. I try to, like, when it's, like, a cultural interaction, I, Cass is uh, really good at, or he's, like, he's pretty good at Spanish, so I kind of would talk with him about, like, having him, like, kind of lead into a situation, mm-hmm. and uh, we'd talk about it before, like, what we try to, like, bring out of that interaction, and then I would try to, like, follow him into it with the camera mm-hmm. and uh, capture that interaction, mm-hmm. you know, just... To, trying to plan ahead um, um yeah trying to anticipate like transition shots because you know we are going into towns uh so you kind of want like shots of like like a landscape shot of people riding into a small city and then you transition into like a like a like, like an interaction in a city and then like you try to just think about how things transition in a film and editing and stuff like that so um, so it was pretty deliberate. Yeah. A lot of it, it sounds like it wasn't like I'm just gonna pull this camera out randomly. Like you're, it sounded like you're editing in your head, or at least like trying to tick off like the, the shots that you needed to to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely like a list uh, of stuff I was brainstorming before, but I mean, you really don't know until you're there, obviously. And um, I really don't want a contrived feeling to it at all. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, you kind of can like push it a little bit, um, but then it's kind of like, or you can kind of like talk about it before, and then like it's just whatever's going to happen is going to happen, and I don't want to like interject midway and try to like steer it mm-hmm. in a particular direction. So same goes for like you know the people that you know like Pepper, uh, Daniel, and Cass is like you know it's you know they're all friends and you know it's. There, there's a lot of like, you know, there's dialogue in the film uh, between all of us, and you know, you get to know the personalities uh, for sure. Um, but like, there's not like, you know, there's, you can't really push like a big like kind of like, you know, like you know, conflict point or anything. Like, mm-hmm. you, you kind of just have to like let it happen how it goes, and like, you know, you see, you see like, you know, their struggle in like the faces like as we're writing and stuff like that but I don't want to like I don't want to like you know have a contrived kind of like story arc that I think of beforehand and try to fit people into that like it's right that's just my style it's not like the the real real world on MTV or something (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, that that is is a a, great show (laughs) (laughs) totally not scripted too (laughs) um Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah that is like a I found like a, a challenge of finding that balance of coming into a, a project with like a plan. So like, you know, that there's going to be like a narrative arc, but also understanding like, you know, there's that saying, no, no, no plan survives like first contact with the enemy, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, having kind of like a blueprint, but also being able to improvise and go, okay, this is, this is not where the story I thought was or this isn't where this where I thought the story was going to go but like being open to to following it from there mm-hmm. yeah totally yeah you just kind of do your best, try your best. <laughs> <laughs> were there times when you were like man I wish I didn't have to film this I could just enjoy it <laughs> yeah yeah it's work it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah. yeah but um yeah yeah I'm yeah I'm pretty close to having it polished up right now and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, yeah. so, and yeah, Daniel's happy with it. So 
Um, so we're really excited to tour with it in May. We're going to be starting at Golden Saddle Cyclery in LA on the 3rd of May. And then we're going to be going up the coast to the bay. Um, we're going to be showing at the Marin Mountain Bike Museum on the 9th, I believe. Um, and then one more location on the 8th in Oakland, downtown Oakland at the Lucky Duck. And then we're going to Velo Colt. Mm -hmm. And then um and then swift is hosting us in the rhino room up in seattle mm -hmm. um and then i we might do a vancouver show so cool um yeah yeah and daniel's really excited about it he's gonna bring up bikes and he's getting a bunch of merch to give away um not only from tumbleweed but from i think wtb um and other companies and they're trying to get like beer lined up. And so it's going to be a party. It's going to be fun. Cool. Um, so those tickets are on sale on his website and you can probably check that out if you're interested. Yeah. So are you doing the, the post, the editing and everything as well? Or you, is that mm -hmm. something else? Yeah. 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 Doing yeah, the whole coloring and sound design and mm -hmm. all that. So, yep. Yeah. Um, how yeah. long, how long is the final film going to be? uh a tad over 25 minutes okay good yeah. yeah yeah and then um i have also been working on a uh a short film with cass cass gilbert on his um his route in uh, ecuador we spent some time in ecuador after peru uh riding um his route down there and um that's more of like kind of like a route guide um if people are interested in that route it's um um kind of a little bit more educational um mm -hmm. kind of slant on on that on with that film so we're gonna be showing that too that's unreleased as well so yeah um, as a little, another nugget for people to come out <laughs> for, the, for the for the screening so yeah yeah so when you uh when you were filming like how did you handle uh the capture were you downloading with a laptop or did you just bring a stack of memory cards mm -hmm. yeah so um I did have uh, a bunch of SD cards, and then um, uh, I used Cass's um, MacBook Air. He's got like a tiny little 11 inch because he he works hard on on tour. Like he his lifestyle is really unique. Um, he's always writing um, uh, like you know articles, uh, working with Logan at Bikepacking.com. Um, you know, he's, he works hard. And, um, so he had his computer there and so I would just dump it into like a, like a, one of those Samsung T3 really tiny, um, kind of SSD hard drives, um, and filled that thing up pretty fast. So I was a little worried, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. So media is definitely part of it. And there's that like, lost some media too i you know i don't know what happens like there's something glitch that happens and right so it's, <laughs> it's, it's never a sure thing so. yeah uh after having done the trip would like what else would you have uh, done differently are you pretty happy yeah with that one down oh yeah no <laughs> i'm always super critical i mean there's so many great examples out there like joey schulster doing like Yeti stuff, like his stuff is really beautiful. Um, just really well done. And, you know, there's so many great examples out there. And so you're always thinking about, man, like I should have nailed that a little bit better, like thought about this aspect or anticipated that. So mm -hmm. no, no, <laughs> definitely, definitely pretty critical of myself, <laughs> but at the same time, like, yeah, I did as best as I could. And, um, you know the people that I show it to are pretty pretty pumped on it, so it makes me feel okay about it. So, cool. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about your sewing endeavor. Is that just going to be a personal project, or are you going to bring a products to market? Trying to. Yeah, I'm working on design right now um, uh, with the the spindle here. The spindle is like a small uh, bag maker um, in Atlanta. And he's helped me out a lot with like learning how to sew. Um, and you know, yeah, it's it's uh, basically, I, I love the Carity Super C. I've had one for years. I actually bought one from Clever Cycle <laughs> up in Portland. And um, 
and uh, I just want to make more of those. I like just love that big. I love that style of just having like a big kind of open, um, accessible uh, storage space. Um, you know, like a like a roll on the front handlebar is fine for super lightweight stuff, but it's always nice to just have like right. you can just open it up and you can grab whatever you need to grab. Um, so just trying to expand on that idea um, and. Um, you know, like with the Fabio's chest and the Jumbo Jammer, like there people are designing that idea and developing that. And I think it's a great design. And I think there's definitely a market for that. Um, it seems like there is. Yeah, for sure. So, I know like so many people that ride bikes and, and rather involved in filmmaking or taking pictures so that, you know, to have like a, a product that kind of addresses some of those issues would be. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's especially for like video or photo work, it's really nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've um, it's a, definitely like a one man operation um, right now. Um, the spin all might help out with like larger production runs. If um, we're right now talking with um, 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 with uh, Daniel about maybe trying trying a little run with him. Um, still the to like be determined as far as like you know what the details of that are but mm -hmm. um yeah right now it's just me sewing um i have this like um old juki walking foot right here <laughs> um, and uh yeah i have like a like a crappy little bar tacker <laughs> <laughs> um hopefully get a little bit nicer equipment um you know everything's solid like the bar tacker works fine but it's just fussy you know they're yeah. old and um and uh but uh yeah um trying trying to work on the design to make it more efficient um you know like right here um like you know like with the caradice pockets i'm not sure if you can see it because it's mm -hmm. black fabric but yeah. like you know caradice pockets are sewn on the side panel like these side pockets are sewn on the side panel they like the pockets here are sewn into the seam mm. that goes all the way around mm -hmm. you know it's just like a one less step or, right uh, for like doing a side pocket so just trying to develop like something that might be more efficient for sewing and um, and then just having a lot of strap options on the bottom like Caradice and traditional saddlebags don't really have that so a lot of people like using racks underneath them and so just giving more options for that and yeah and trying to source the buckles uh, from like U.S. manufacturers and you know, fabric suppliers. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun. Like, I mean, editing is tough, like day in, day out. Um, and film work is so like, it's a nice break right. uh, to kind of like something like tactile with your hands. And yeah, for like sure. That, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's very satisfying. And um, yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, hopefully, how, how did your, uh, your prototype bag perform were you pretty happy with, with how it worked out on the trip yeah yeah it, uh, nothing broke <laughs> <laughs> step number one <laughs> yeah yeah there wasn't a whole lot of uh moisture getting in or anything um yeah it worked fine i mean i sewed it on like a singer 4423 which is like an amazon special like hundred dollar heavy duty <laughs> machine you know i don't know what the heck i was doing yeah uh, like a year and a half ago so you know it's the stitching is horrible but if i had this machine and it made that like it it would have been a lot nicer but it worked fine um but yeah yeah it held in there yeah, yeah so. so how do you think um like what like what considerations for like uh someone that that's carrying cameras dictates you know, something in the bag, like, how is it different from, from like a typical, like, it, I guess, Caradice? Yeah, yeah, uh, padding. Padding. Um, padding's a big part of it. Um, and then just, like, quick accessibility, um, kind of almost like in uh, trying to have it, like, a little bit wider and flatter so you, it, there's not as much depth to it. So, you know, like a camera bag, when you flip it open, there's all these compartments, kind of try to, like, in lieu of that kind of idea um trying to make it just more organized and accessible because you know it just can be a, like it, everything can get jumbled up in like a normal saddlebag um if you know um it can be disorganized so 
<laughs> try to incorporate some organization to it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. yeah, I do a lot of filming off the bike too. And I've experimented like tons with different ways to carry cameras and, and gear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You have some really amazing hacks with that GoPro, yeah. like the microphone and stuff, <laughs> man, you got, I'm really enjoying that stuff. So. Yeah. For me, it's, um, you know, I've, I shoot with the Panasonic, which which I love for the film quality, but for like, you know, quick daily videos or capturing a ride, it's a lot of camera to bring around. And I, and I mm -hmm. look at like the people vlogging on the bike, they're always shooting on the wide end, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, they've got a mic. So like the GoPro with like a small mic kind of generally emulates that. So to have that as like the A cam and then like a small mm -hmm. pocket camera as the, the B camera for a little bit more reach, you know, mm -hmm. like I wouldn't probably not shoot something and submit it to a film festival or something, but for, for YouTube, it's it worked pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It looks great. Totally. Yeah. yeah it's a good little setup. Yeah. So do you, do you have a, a timeline for, for your bags or is that still just playing it by ear? Yeah. Well, I did like a really soft kind of uh, Instagram post or um, on, I just have like an Instagram page for right now. Um, people can message me directly through that if uh, they're curious, but it's just red star bag, okay. singular bag um, right now. And um, yeah, um, just uh, have a few people interested and might do that. I'm still developing I'm trying to figure out like a strap system, how to make it attached to either saddle or handlebars. But um, mm -hmm. Um, it's just a standard kind of three quarter inch strap mm -hmm. meant per three quarter inch strap. Um, so if people have things, it's easy to attach. Um, it's like a, you know, it has like a dowel. Mm -hmm. It's a traditional style, mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of English saddlebag, um, an ode to the super C. So. <laughs> how much, uh, <laughs> how much vertical clearance do you need between like the mount mounting point and the bottom of the bag? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm trying to offer two different heights because, uh, I think people really need some, uh, some customization with that because of bike size, obviously. Um, so right now I have one that's like eight and a half, like the bag's like eight and a half inches tall. And then I have a taller one that's like a 10 and a quarter. And so I think that works out to like on the small one, it's like 10 inches of, uh, clearance. And then on the bigger one, it's like 12. Okay. Um, and, um, but um, I want to try to figure out how to offer different sizes or different heights, like more than that. Um, but I think I'm just going to start with those two right now. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I'm just going to keep on exploring saddlebags. I really want to um, mess with like that new X10, Z, like a uh, X pack that um, Swift has been developing with Dimension Polyvant, which that makes X pack. Is that that kind of like so, canvasy one on the exterior? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so good looking. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's ten ounce canvas um, laminated on like a X pack ripstop, so it's like like it's uh, waterproof mm -hmm. um, and it's super strong and stiff. Um, mm -hmm. And so I want to develop that idea um, with uh, the spindle here. Um, come on, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, just keep exploring that and, you know, everything's going more and more waterproof. So just trying to chase that or like, you know, more and more water resistant. Um, mm -hmm. If something's sewn, it's not like, you know, waterproof. Um, <laughs> you know, the porcelain rocket um, with their like uh, radio frequency welding and stuff like that, like that stuff is amazing. But those machines are pretty, pretty expensive. Right. So, um, but yeah, for us. Yeah. Us smaller folk <laughs> going, <laughs> so, much for us, so, but it, it works, it works fine. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, let's loop back to the film real quick. Uh, what, what do you hope people like, go uh, after watching the film walk away with? I just, you know, like, I just hope people get stoked to like get out and travel and, um, you know, just travel to these places that, you know, are so amazing in all these different ways um yeah it's just so nice being out for a couple of weeks um in a totally different place and um yeah just stoke keep the stoke up get people motivated so and that's where, all i really hope for 
So. Where should where should people go then to buy tickets and find find out about show dates and stuff? Yeah, so t- uh, you can um, find out about that stuff on just Tumbleweed's website. I think okay. it's uh, tumbleweed.cc. Well, so. <clears throat> I'll put a link in the description below. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks uh, so much, Jay, for chatting with us today. If you guys have any other questions, leave those in the comments below. I'll try to get Jay to answer them. And uh, if you guys liked uh, this episode, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Uh, keep the supple side down. And thanks once again, Jay, for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks, YouTubers, for watching. (laughs) Thanks again for listening or watching uh, another episode of PLP Talks. Totally appreciate that you guys are digging this series. And if you could do me the quick favor, if you're listening via a podcasting app, please go to that app, rate and review it so this show can be discovered and spread the bike nerd love. And once again, if you want to support this uh, series financially, check out the show notes and how you can do that. And until next time, keep the supple side down.